The idea that science is some kind of process for proving conjectures seems to be constantly circulating in debate groups on social media. Basically, people seem to think science starts with a hypothesis, then it seeks to find supporting evidence for that hypothesis, and once some standard of a sufficient amount of evidence has finally been found, we elevate that hypothesis to the status of a theory, and then we know it's right. But that's not really how science works at all. The biggest problem with this idea is that there is no standard for what counts as a sufficient amount of evidence. That's not even a real thing. So how does science really work? It's important for people to understand this, so let's take a closer look. The way science actually works is more like this. Scientists come up with many hypotheses. Sure, we might all have one hypothesis that we personally prefer, but good scientists try very hard not to let their personal biases influence their work. So we try to give consideration to all possible explanations. A good way to visualize this is with a categorical distribution. We assign some probability to each of the many categories, and those probabilities all sum to one. When new empirical evidence is found, it may support one of the hypotheses, or sometimes it may introduce a new hypothesis. That's always okay, too. But since the probabilities must sum to one, any evidence that supports one explanation reduces the total amount of consideration left to give to the other explanations. Sometimes people like to think that God is somehow immune from being touched by science. They might reason that since God is supernatural and science only investigates the natural, that science can never say anything at all about God. But this is actually poor reasoning. Science doesn't need to investigate the supernatural to tell us things about God. Every time evidence is found for a natural explanation, it implicitly reduces the total amount of consideration left for supernatural explanations. Significantly, this process does not work if we are too anxious to throw out improbable explanations. You see, when there is only one explanation on the table of consideration, it obviously gets all of the consideration. But then how do we learn? We cannot. Learning is the very focus and purpose of science, so it is absolutely essential not to throw out possible explanations just because we judge them to be improbable. That's what closed-minded, dogmatic people do, and it absolutely cripples their ability to learn. Since science is all about learning, it requires being open to the possibility of having something to learn. Over time, of course, the evidence tends to line up behind one hypothesis much more than all the others. This usually makes it pretty clear which one is probably right. But as I stated earlier, there is no standard or threshold for knowing how much evidence we need. It is up to each individual scientist to study the literature and decide for him or herself when a hypothesis has been settled. This is what empowers science to work without any authorities and without any standardizing bodies that we are all required to listen to. And that lack of centralization is an important property of science. So when it becomes clear that a hypothesis has been settled, is that when it turns into a theory? No, that's not how it works at all. You see, a hypothesis is a narrow explanation for something very specific, something that can be directly tested. A theory is a broad explanation for something very general. A theory ties together many different hypotheses. Some of these hypotheses may have been thoroughly settled, but many of them are often still speculative, and that's okay. A theory is not some kind of claim about what is true. It's an attempt to explain a general phenomenon. As with hypotheses, we also keep multiple theories on the table of consideration, and we give varying degrees of consideration to each of them. But unlike hypotheses, good theories are very difficult to make, so when new evidence is discovered, we don't just discard theories willy-nilly. We adjust them to accommodate the new evidence. This seems to be a source of great frustration to people who want the answers right now, but we don't always know the answers right now. So any attempt to reach a definite conclusion prematurely is really just making stuff up, and science doesn't just make stuff up. What happens is that over time, some theories begin to elegantly explain a great many settled hypotheses, and other theories start to look, well, ugly. They have to resort to all sorts of mental gymnastics to accommodate the evidence, 
And that ugliness is important. It tells us how much consideration to give to each of the theories. So when judging a theory, it's even less about proof and much more about making a subjective assessment. See, we like theories that are simple and elegant, and we don't like theories that are awkward or that make a lot of improbable leaps. As an example, let's contrast the theories of evolution and creationism. One of these depends on the prior existence of the most powerful, intelligent, and extraordinary being that ever lived. By contrast, the other depends on the existence of the very simplest and least extraordinary creature that ever lived. From the perspective of parsimony, one of these theories maximizes plausibility, while the other seems to be deliberately trying to minimize it. Next, let's take a look at the empirical evidence. The theory of evolution was originally based on observations of living creatures. Numerous fossils were later found that helped to validate the theory. And later still, techniques for sequencing DNA that were not even imagined when the theory was produced yielded extremely strong statistical validation that evolution was probably correct. Although the theory has been revised many times, it still remains very simple and very elegant. By contrast, there is a lack of strong empirical evidence for creationism. In order to maintain that theory, all sorts of explanations have been devised. For example, some people have suggested that God may have been behind evolution. Others have suggested that maybe he wants to test our faith, and so he allows the devil to plant false evidence supporting evolution for scientists to find. Yet, no matter how much evidence has been uncovered, and despite all the rantings of people who are too anxious to throw out theories they dislike, creationism has never been definitively disproven. It has just morphed into a very complex and ugly theory. But beauty, of course, remains in the eye of the beholder. There are plenty of people who still insist that evolution is the uglier theory, and there are plenty of people who sincerely believe creationism is intuitive and that the leaps it makes are somehow reasonable. So how do we use science to tell our creationist friends that evolution is an established fact? How do we make them accept the truth? Unfortunately, this is how well-intentioned people turn science into something that is not science. You see, that's trying to use science as an authority, and science does not establish things by authority. Establishing things by authority is the dogmatic, closed-minded, religious way of doing things. So just stop. Science does not tell anyone what conclusions they must draw. It tells us why some explanations are more elegant than others. You might ask, what about scientific consensus? Doesn't that turn science into some sort of an authority? Perhaps it does, but scientific consensus is not a scientific concept. It's a political one. You see, politicians need to take actions, and taking actions requires them to decide which knowledge to base their decisions upon. Scientific consensus is a pretty good heuristic for making pretty good decisions, but it is not some kind of declaration about what is true. A good scientist wouldn't even care what the scientific consensus is in his own domain of expertise. After all, he would be familiar with the evidence, and being familiar with the evidence trumps scientific consensus. It must. If it didn't, scientists would never make any progress. They would just sit around reinforcing what they already believe. And again, that's the religious method, not the scientific method. It's important to note that even scientific consensus is vulnerable to being attacked. Sometimes people form scientific groups that publish papers about creationism, homeopathy, and even how the Earth is flat. They review each other's works and claim to establish consensus for their ridiculous theories. My point is, consensus really doesn't mean that much. There is no way to tell someone that evolution is a fact without misleading them. Evolution is an explanation, not a fact. It happens to be an extremely elegant explanation. It has been validated by such an overwhelming number of observations that few informed and educated people can even imagine it ever being replaced by another theory. But even that does not make something a fact. It's still an explanation. So the right things to discuss are specific evidence and specific reasons, not conclusions. Telling people what to conclude is trying to use science as an authority, and science does not establish things by authority. If your creationist friends cannot see the beauty and elegance of the theory of evolution, they're probably not ready to reach that conclusion. That may be ignorant, but people can only take steps from where they are. 
Science is never established by forceful leaps propelled by the wills of authorities. It is established one step at a time as each piece of empirical evidence makes tiny adjustments to the consideration we give to the candidate explanations. The very progress of knowledge itself is an evolutionary process, and evolution thrives on diversity. So if you want to change someone's mind, don't exaggerate your certainty. Don't pretend you have some kind of authority or more evidence than you are actually prepared to present right then. And don't even tell them what conclusions to draw. Just educate them. Help them understand what you really know and let them judge the beauty of your theories for themselves. That's how science advances.